Hey there students! In this video, I'm going to explain the new guidelines for the AP Euro DBQ as of summer 2017. I'm going to be using a rubric that's available on my website, tomritchie.net, one rubric to rule them all. Check out my website if you want to get a copy of the rubric. Also, this is an introductory video and it's going to be part of my eight-month writing clinic, which is a subscription-based service that goes very detailed into how to get all of these points. I'm going to give you an introduction here on YouTube, but if you want more, feel free to check out the eight-month writing clinic on my website. So as far as the time frame for the DBQ, the DBQ will be restricted from 1600 to present, which is really kind of an arbitrary date that's going to be in the middle of the age of absolutism, the end of the Renaissance, in the middle of the Reformation, you know, really just kind of in the midst of all of that, almost at the end of the so-called period one to the present. Now, whenever that is, there's a little bit of discussion. How far are these DBQs going to go? I doubt that you're going to see something go to 2017, but this is the range for the DBQ on the exam. So the sample prompt for the DBQ that I've written for the eight-month writing clinic is before 1600, but it's never too early to practice. So this is something to kind of get you thinking very early in the year about how to do the DBQ. Evaluate the extent to which the invention of the printing press altered the lives of Europeans. Now, this prompt will even make you go before 1450 a little bit, but this is, of course, in the concept outline. You need to understand that the printing press made a very big difference on a variety of fronts. So first of all, let's go ahead and work on our thesis or claim. Responds to the prompt with a historically defensible thesis or claim that establishes a line of reasoning. The thesis must make a claim that responds to the prompt rather than merely restating or rephrasing the prompt. The thesis must consist of one or more sentences located in one place, either in the introduction or the conclusion. So just to make sure we're clear on the guidelines for the thesis statement, first of all, it must be historically defensible. It must say something that is true that can be defended with evidence. Secondly, it must have a line of reasoning. Now, the best way to make sure that there is a line of reasoning is to have a preview of points, that it previews multiple points, at least two preferably three, because that's going to show that this is actually going somewhere. I can actually develop this argument. And the points that are previewed in your thesis are going to be the subjects of your body paragraph. Now remember that the thesis statement must appear in the introduction or the conclusion. And it must be everywhere at once as far as in one place. Okay, So it must be, if it's a two-sentence thesis, must be two consecutive sentences. An example of an unacceptable thesis would be the printing press resulted in a lot of changes in the lives of Europeans. This doesn't say anything. There is nothing here that I can sink my teeth into. Another unacceptable thesis would be the invention of the printing press resulted in a decline in religious belief in Europe because it allowed widespread circulation of works of existentialist philosophy. This person doesn't know what time period they're in, all right? And the printing press did not result in a decline in religious belief. So this is an example of a thesis that previews some points, but those points are not historically defensible. Here is an example of an acceptable thesis, a well-written thesis that previews three points. The printing press greatly altered the lives of Europeans because it increased literacy, made the Reformation possible, and aided the scientific revolution. And you see here that this thesis can be defended very easily in three body paragraphs, one focusing on the increased literacy, another focusing on the Reformation, and another focusing on the scientific revolution. An excellent thesis would go something like this. 
While the invention of the printing press increased literacy and helped to bring about the Protestant Reformation and the Scientific Revolution, it did not change the mindset of Catholic Church leaders who continued to condemn those who opposed their doctrines. Now, this thesis brings in some nuance and some qualification. We'll talk about the final point, the complex understanding point later, but this thesis is setting up that complex understanding and nuance, these are going to be necessary to get that final point. And this is what I sometimes call a threesis because I think that it's great to make sure that you have three points that you are defending when you write your thesis because the documents are typically set up so that they can be grouped to make three different arguments. And if you do this, if you get the documents two, two, and three, then it's very easy to set up your DBQ this way where you're making three points to support one argument. Next, let's look at contextualization. Describes a broader historical context relevant to the prompt. The response must relate the topic of the prompt to broader historical events, developments, or processes that occur before, during, or continue after the time frame of the question. This point is not awarded merely for a phrase or a reference. So what we're doing here is we're setting up some very useful background. Something that if you pretend that the reader knows nothing, here's something that they would need to know in order to understand where I'm going with this. Contextualization provides the link between the prompt and the thesis. So ideally, contextualization should appear first in your essay, which is why I have it first on the rubric, even before the thesis, because in your first paragraph, you should aim for contextualization, which is going to take some things that are relevant to the prompt and lead the reader to the thesis. So see contextualization as a link. There are some teachers who are teaching their students to write the thesis halfway down the first page and then to go back and write the contextualization so that it is leading to the thesis. Make sure that the contextualization is useful. That is very important. That it can't just be something random from the same time period that has no bearing on the essay. So note that it is not a requirement that contextualization appear before your thesis statement, but it is something that I think is useful. It is something that I advise. Good contextualization will form a perimeter around your argumentative essay, giving the reader useful background that will not be found in the body of the essay. So remember that it's very important that there is not any double dipping. Whatever's counted for contextualization cannot be counted for any other point in your essay, that whatever's here has to be unique. Contextualization needs to be multiple sentences. Don't short yourself on this one. And make sure that these sentences actually say something. Just because contextualization is background, some people think, well, it should be vague. It should not be vague. It should actually say something of substance. So I encourage students to put in at least one or two details in their contextualization. So there you have it. One paragraph two points, contextualization and thesis. So by the time you've written the first paragraph effectively, you should have two out of the seven points, which places you almost at the average right off the bat. And in the next segment, I'm going to focus on how to use the documents. There should be a card here. There's also going to be a link in the description. So go ahead and click through if you want to learn about how to effectively use the documents on the DBQ. Also, remember to check out my eight-month writing clinic at TomRitchie.net. It's always a pleasure.